Okay, so essentially what I'm trying to do is presenting to you some of the basic notions which evolved from an epistemological, theoretical, mathematical point of view into that realm which we call today constructivism. So there's a general name for that thing, constructivism. Five years ago, ten years ago, you may have asked people, have you heard about constructivism? You've never heard about that, what is that? So constructivism as a notion was more or less unknown. Fascinatingly enough, today, so many people are interested in this problematic. So many people would like to know what's going on. And I think there are essentially uh, some very important contributors to this field. One is, of course, Paul Watzlawick with several books reflecting on the constructed realities, invented realities. Uh, many people apply. The notion of uh, uh, construction, I think, uh, is a very important one because it is leading us away from earlier notions, namely that one doesn't construct, one is just uh, a camera, a tape recorder, a camera seeing what the world is, recording it, gets a little bit of noise and, and bring it about in speech or thoughts of the character. These notions must give way, as we should see, to another one, namely the one where we become active, where we become co-generative in the notions which we produce, one of the social context of language, therefore I have to talk about languages. So my plan now uh, to introduce the whole thing is to present to you six installments six installments and I would like to do three today and I understand I have to do three tomorrow and you have to suffer through three other installments and I give you a little bit of a list of my installments and uh, uh, really uh, plenty. The first one I would like to do is giving you a short expose so to say a litmus test of how to find out whether somebody is a constructivist or not. And, uh, so oh, very easy, you know, like putting a litmus paper into something and find out whether it's green or whether it's blue or whether it's red. And it's red, you know, it's an acid. And, uh, so the one is a, is a short version of, of uh, a compressed version of constructivism. The second one, since constructivism is turning the world upside down, that means the world which we traditionally believe we are talking about and things like that. The whole notion of understanding is turned upside down in constructivism. And this is not easy because, for instance, if you have lots of ballast on your feet and you would like to stand on your hands, it's very hard to lift that thing up. Yeah. So we have to get rid of that ballast. And I would like, therefore, to give you an uh, expose of the conceptual difficulties which are encountered when one embraces the new way of perceiving uh, acquisition of knowledge, the epistemological question, and the theoretical notion. So that by chapter number two, or story number three, now ladies and gentlemen, you have to prepare yourself for quite an exposure. I would like to use one very clear language to account for certain processes with which we have to be. And I find usually uh, notions which have to do with computing very much to uh, help or to improve the clarity of the expose. Now in the moment if one mentions about computation to my humanistic or medical friends, they immediately disappear like snail in the snail house. So <laughs> I try to bring you out Lure, you see, so you out so that you look out and look with your four eyes. What's going on in computation? And uh, let me briefly say that the word computation in itself uh, has nothing to do with numbers. Computare. Putare comes from Latin. Computare means to think, to contemplate, to consider. And com means together. So computation means to consider things together. And for instance, sometimes it can be, of course, numbers. You can be consider four 
and five together in the center of a multiplication, and then you know what the result will be. But you can, of course, consider a particular sentence, its context, the way in which you can draw a conclusion. You may consider, for instance, a whole poem, a computation, because in a poem, thoughts are put together. And in the poem, you consider the whole poem, poem in its entirety. That you are not considering the single cases, this, or the single words. This is quite clear. Nobody uh, in his right sense of mind asks what is the meaning of the second letter of the third line of a Shakespearean sonnet. And you compute that sonnet. Okay, computation will be chapter number three, and I will end when you are completely wiped out, collapsed at five o'clock. Then we will make a big admission, and then we go home, eat, sleep, come and refresh. <laughs> Next morning, however, we start with something much tougher. Start immediately with a recount of some of the essential features of the central nervous system. And you will ask me, why the central nervous system? The central nervous system is featured. If you appreciate these features, the whole notion of constructing a reality, even the whole notion of language, the whole notion of two beings interacting with each other takes an entirely different perspective. So I will explore some of the basic notions of the central nervous system as they have emerged in the last, I would say, 15 or 20 years, when suddenly fundamental questions regarding its operations came. We will end the CNS, the central nervous system, by a discussion with a fundamental riddle, with a fabulous problem, like a detective story. And uh, what had, would have been appropriate if I, I would have stopped tonight with that riddle, so that you indeed are. Uh, forced to come tomorrow to see the resolution of it. But I uh, will forego this trick, and uh, I'm sure you will come without that gimmick. And uh, I will then, in the next round, under a title which is called Closure, try to present uh, the resolution of the problem. Closure, as you already sense, has something to do with an entity, if you not the first a system, a system which is considered open is being closed. So that uh, one thing, one part of the system refer to another and the other refer again back to the one. Therefore you see already the self-referential circle going around in that closure. For instance the title of that thing, as I pointed already out, understanding, understanding. So that means applies and notion that the shortest circle you can imagine. And after that, I come to the conclusion of my presentation. After closure, I have enclosure. That means when you include the logic of the inclusion of the therapist in the therapeutic uh, context. So that he is not sitting outside of the whole thing and conducts and directs, so to say, what's going on with the command structure, but is part of the system and just rolls along with the changes of that system, initiating these changes and suffering, <laughs> participating in these changing systems as well. Again, difficulty with that logic occur. You might perhaps be familiar with some of the anthropological work. The anthropologists who are working the field have to do two things. They have to be framed with the people with whom they interact, otherwise they never have a name, which is like that. But they have to be strangers as well. And perhaps if you are a little bit familiar with the anthropological literature, there's a very important book which pra practically every young anthropologist has to see. This is by the power maker. The title is Stranger and Friend. That is a paradoxical situation. But this paradoxical situation is one of the skills, as I say it, uh, good family therapy has to be able to do. So to say, it's playing two roles at the same time, being a friend, at the same time being outside, inside and outside at the same time. What is the logic 
of being inside and outside as well without being a paradox. Okay, now let me give you, I begin now with chapter, Mary's installment number one, short expose of, uh, of what? Uh, the best way of finding out whether somebody is a constructivist is to uh, <coughs> ask him how he feels about the following concepts. You have to tell him, look, the following notion, a formula, an idea, a concept, an object, the notion of symmetry, the notion of order, of a taxonomy, laws of nature. Are these things discovered? Or are they invented? Are, for instance, mathematical formulas invented? Are they discovered? Read the 19th century literature on this problem, gives you a big fight. Uh, concepts, objects, are they discovered? Are they invented by God who could think for a moment that an object is invented for heaven's But the interesting thing is, if you give that a test, to somebody and he says, I would tend to answer that these things are inventions. You know it's a constructivist. Uh, I would like to read a little story to you, which uh, you will find in Steps to an Ecology of Mind by Gregory Bateson. It is one of his beautiful, lovely little metalogues. These metalogues are reflecting either invented or maybe actual dialogues a papa, I think it was probably Gregory Bateson, with a daughter, a very precocious young girl who is asking very unpleasant questions. <coughs> so in these metalogues, Gregory Bateson is able to reveal lots of the essential thinking, the philosophical notions which he has, without giving them the the tremendous weight, which would usually when I say, I'm writing a book on philosophy. So he didn't say that at all. He said, I'm telling you about the metal work with my, uh, with Abel. I have here, uh, unfortunately, what happened is that yes, I was preparing some handouts for you. But I was doing it very late in the evening, so I had to use my own uh, copy machine. My own copying machine was running out of the cartridge was empty. So what I did, I took some uh, extras which I had in a German, in German version of Rome, and uh, later on I was distributed. I think uh, you a German would be good enough to understand what's on here, even if you are Chinese, Turkish, Italians, or even Germans. I mean, uh, it might be easy to understand. Now, anyway, what I should do is I quickly translate that in my mind and I give you that metalogue <coughs> because there are many comments which I would like to make. The structure of these metalogues is always the same. The little daughter asks Papa, what is this, what is that, why is this, why is that. One instant, daughter asks, Daddy, what is an instinct? So of course it is. My daughter or son would ask me, Daddy, what is an instinct? I would have been very proud that I can rattle off a very good definition of what is an instinct. I would have said probably, an instinct is, is unlearned behavior, this behavior which is innate in an animal, complex behavior which is released by particular stimulus. I would love to have a wonderful lexical definition. Now this papa, however, is not for it, that. The moment if the word instinct is popping up, he refers not to the semantics, he refers to the politics that happened if in a dialogue one partner is using the term instinct. What does he want to do when he uses instinct? And not talking about behavior, whatever. What does he want to do? So, Father, after the question, what is an instinct? An instinct, my dear, is an exclamatory principle. An instinct is an exclamatory principle. Hmm. Daughter, but what does it explain? She says. 
Well, oh, everything, almost everything, everything you will uh, an explanatory principle can explain. Anyway, the daughter is very suspicious. Oh, oh Lord, 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 don't be ridiculous. It can't explain gravitation. Father says. But this is only because nobody wants instinct to explain gravitation. If one wanted to explain instinct with gra gravitation, we would simply say that the moon has an instinct whose strength vanishes inverse of the square of the distance, so blah, blah, blah. I don't have to say, not say, you know, that is, that is nonsense. I know, but you, said something about instinct, not I. <laughs> okay, then explain to me what is gravitation. What explains gravitation? But I, nothing, my dear, because gravitation is an explanatory principle. <laughs> oh, do you want to say that with a principle of an explanatory principle, you can't explain another one? <clears throat> uh, practically, uh, it was uh, probably this is what Newton meant when he said, "Hypothesis non thingo." And what does that mean? Then? You know what hypotheses are. Now, please watch. Uh, this daddy, this father, uses completely everything in the descriptive domain. That means everything he's talking about is drawing the attention that we are talking about things. It is in speech where the things occur. And not some Now watch what he says. <coughs> you know what hypothesis? Any arbitrary formulation of two descriptive statements that are being put together by them is a hypothesis. If you say that on the 1st of February there will be full moon, and on 1st of March there is the gain of full moon, and when do you then combine these two statements in any way, the statement which connects these two uh, observations is a hypothesis. Hmm. Yes, and I know what non but what is the notion? What is the word? Fingo hypothesis. Fingo. Now, fingo, Papa says, is a Latin word for to do, to make. One can, with this word, form a verbal substantive noun, and that is fictive. Uh, this is the word from which we derive our notion of fiction. Ah, dead. You don't want to say that Sir Isaac Newton suppose that all hypotheses are simply fiction, have been invented like stories? Precisely. But didn't he uh, discover gravity with watching that apple? No, my dear. He invented it. <laughs> okay, I want to give an example of two things. One, how Gregory Bateson deals with the laws of nature as being intervention. The other thing is that he is dealing with explanatory principles. So explanation and laws of nature are the center of that lovely conceptual center, or politically center, if you wish, of that little matter. Now, of course, <coughs> Let me say a word about laws of nature, because uh, they are usually referred to as this is it. Okay, basically, I point out they are invented. Now, let me see what is really the logical structure, the difference between the logic structure of so-called laws of nature and so-called laws of culture. These are the laws we give each other controlling our behavior. So when we break a law that is given, by the culture, then the guy who is breaking the law is going to jail. 
Now, let's look at laws of nature. So, if you watch, for instance, uh, the planetary motion, and uh, suddenly Mercury is not behaving according to Newton's law of gravitation. It stands in a little bit out of this whole rule of the laws of nature. Then it's not Mercury who goes to jail. It is Newton who is being drawn. <laughs> and somebody else comes along and says, well, Mr. Einstein, you have the new laws of nature until somebody else drops Mr. Einstein. So I would like to recommend watching these distinctions between the two laws. And I would recommend that if a cultural law is broken and is considered more and more, the lawmaker should go to jail, <laughs> not the one who breaks the law. Because sometimes these laws are so idiotic that the only way to survive is to break them. Now, anyway. <laughs> now, anyway, the notion of invention. Why do I insist that notion of invention in our context is very useful? The only thing what I can say is an example, which I once had of the success of the notion of invention. I was, again, this is the Canadian experience, and Mr. Tom, Carl Tom, has written a major uh, manifesto for in which way to handle the therapeutic family therapeutic situation. And here he had a major aim, that means he said, the most important thing of the whole family therapeutic situation is that we help uh, the members of the family to discover a new reality. And he said, very nice, let me read that thing in my way. The essential way of our family therapy is the point is that we help our family members to invent and reality. And I remember when I said that, it was about the same, I said, ah, that's a different story. It's a fundamentally different story. And why is it so fundamentally different? Because if you were to discover something, it's already sitting somewhere. If you lift up that, and look at the where is it there? And if it's there, <laughs> then it's there. You have done nothing but just lifting up the same plant that is there. However, when you invent it, you are the creative part. You have to generate it. You have to bring it forth. Generate, create something. Suddenly, you become a poet. And that invention, of course, is sitting much deeper, much more profound. than if you were just stumbling on something, say, ha ha, here was another reality. Uh, so I therefore I propose that again, because I failed, then discover was replaced by invent a new horizon was open. Okay, as you can already see, when you switch from this kind of invent, particularly in connection with reality and other questions, for instance, object, how can we invent object, everything, laws of nature, there are some difficulties associated. And as I say, of course, we have to do that some sort. If you have some tariffs on our feet, and it might not be too easy to do that also. So, uh, I would like now to address myself to some points of that ballast. And I would like to illuminate the notion which are the orthodox or traditional notion with which we grew up, which are to be found in every textbook, everybody's talking about that, and to undermine this notion show their fantasious position, show that they are not grounded on solid ground, flip them over and you will see something entirely and popular, at least in what I hope. There are several points uh, uh, which I would like to illuminate. I give you a uh, So this is now my chapter number two, talking about the balance. There are several points each one probably will take 10 minutes. And in the midst of these 10 points, probably I, I propose we have a little intermission because it's not easy for you people, you have already a whole morning behind you, and now three more hours from some material which is uh, you're not too familiar with, I hope. Uh, so uh, to survive that is not easy. For me, it's easy because I'm speaking, but for you, it's difficult to listen. Uh, so I appreciate you're much, much harder to 
transition. So we will make around, I would say, two to five, around three, twenty, three, fifty, three, thirty. Depends on about an hour. But I will see from the shrinking of your pupils, other than your eye collapsing over that, we can still sustain the So anyway, look forward for the next 50 minutes, and then we will have coffee over there. No, hopeless. So my seven points to just warn you what they will be. The first, what I would like to talk is about the logic of perception. But uh, probably I can't do that because Paul Ratzler will catch the thing. Oh, I could do the phone. I can distribute that and give it back to me. This whole thing, there's an experiment on, 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 on that. Shit. Logic of perception. The second one is the problematic which arises in the moment when you start to explain something. An explanation is blinding. And I think this is probably the idea. This is the thing which Bateson was referred to. Explanatory principle. I would make a brief reference regarding the basic notion with which we drive home explanation. And that we are riding on the notion of causality. I will make a short review of causality so that you see the specificity of that form of explanation as opposed to metaphor, uh, parable, story, gesture, embracing, and a lot of ways of explaining things. But causality is one which is a Western traditional way of camping along. Next one I would like to talk uh, about ontology. The reason why I'm talking about ontology, and I will also refer to that later, is nowadays uh, a very fundamental thinker, a German thinker by the name of Heidegger, who was addressing himself essentially to the notion of ontology, has entered in his writings and his references into the American family, beauty family. And uh, I feel that Heidegger has misunderstood some of the basic notions which we have with the theory and with the formalism. And if we do not straighten that error out, it will be a little bit dangerous for those people who would like to apply theoretical epistemologic consideration to their therapeutic process and practice. So I would make a point on ontology. Then I would like to talk a little bit about enclosure. This is a logically paradoxical situation. I would like to straighten that out. Then I will talk a little bit about language, what it does. And uh, finally, I would report about what I feel is our difficulty with the notion of reality, which is based on a tradition which is approximately 2,000 years old. So these are my seven points which I would like to touch upon the difficulties. And in the middle we have a break. And uh, the last installment today I will talk about computation. OK, why don't we run this little thing here uh, so everybody gets it. We only need the first few and whatever it says in German, it doesn't really Uh, on the first page, uh, you see, oops, I think I have to go. On the first page, left, oh, yeah, the whole thing, as you can easily see, constructivismus, which in English means constructivism, I think. And as you see, it is represented that Roboros, the notion of constructivism, is exactly what I would like to present next. The closure notion. Things go circularity the notion. Okay, now the experiment I would like to invite you to participate is presented on the left lower corner of that page number one. And you see an asterisk and you see a big block. And now I tell you how to perform this experiment. 
It says underneath exactly, but I will give it to you in English and it's very easy. Hold this sheet. Hold this sheet. With a right hand. Hold this sheet with a right hand. Close the left eye. Some people have difficulty closing an eye. Therefore, I said hold the thing with the right hand so that you can close your left eye with the, with the left hand. So, and fixate with the right eye the asterisk. So hold, close your left eye, fixate the asterisk with the right eye. Now, move your, move this sheet in the direction of sight, slowly forward and backward, always keeping that asterisk fixate at the point. And there's a point, suddenly, where the black spot disappears. No black spot anymore. You can hold it when you hold it very good. You can move it around and there's never a black spot anymore. You have to learn a little bit to fix it, fixating the last. Do it very slowly. You have it gotten already? No. Bring it slower, slower, slower. A little, a little closer, a little closer. Now I think slowly the spot will disappear. Don't cheat, you say. Don't watch over the spot is still there or not. A little closer, a little closer, a little closer. Here, about here. Hold it on to vis a vis your nose. Hold it, hold the sheet in the center. Have you gotten it? Have you gotten it? Spot disappeared, spot disappeared. No spot, no, didn't disappear. Disappeared, disappeared. disappeared. Every, no spot on that sheet of paper. Okay, very good. Right. Now the fascinating thing is, for those who have not yet seen, I recommend exercising uh, at home. <laughs> So the, the fascinating thing is that there is a black spot in our feet, or what's going on. Now, of course, physiologists have an explanation. And I would like now to do the same thing. I'm giving you the explanation why this black spot is. Now, I would like to, to do now two things. One of the two is that you listen to how I explain that stuff. The second thing I would like to invite you to watch or to observe yourself what happens to you when this thing is explained. So two things, watch the explanation, watch yourself what happens when, they, when you say, ah, now I know what happens. Okay, the whole thing is relatively simple. If you have, here the eye, And here you have this asterisk, and here is the black spot. And here's the lens, and here's the retina, and here's the optic nerve which is leaving the eye. Then you can hold the bit of paper in such a fashion, when I ask you to fixate the asterisk, you hold the paper such that the asterisk falls onto the fovea. Fovea centralis, which is the most sensitive part of the eye. This is the place where all the cones are sitting and where you have optimal vision. So when I ask you to fixate something, you automatically bring the image, which is projected through the lens, onto that spot in the eye. Now, if I ask you to move that sheet of paper in such a fashion that suddenly black spot appears, then the black spot is projected onto that region of the eye where the optic nerve goes to the uh, central nervous system. At that spot, there is not a single cone and there's a not uh, any uh, sensory receptor. So at that place, of course, when something is projected at this point, you can't see it. And uh, so no wonder that under certain condition, when that black spot is projected onto it, it is called the disc. Uh, 
for nærmere vi optiti, diskus nærmere vi optiti. Jeg kan se, vi kan se, hvad der er sendt. Explained, vi når der, vi understand, now we can go on, we can go to sleep, we can start reading the Wall Street Journal or whatever, whatever else we would like to amuse us. Now I would like to find out that at the moment you come up with such an explanation, you suppress a certain amount of curiosity. And the curiosity which is suppressed after that explanation is given is a wrong thing. Why is it the case that if I look into the world, into that room, and I know there is a black spot, I don't find spot in my eye, how come that I don't see a hole in my visual field, something where I don't see anything? The visual field I was completely closed. There is no perturbation of the visual field. Everything I see, I see complete. How come that this is the case? What's going on? Who is filling in for me so that I see, I believe, to see everything overall? I have a big hole, a blind spot in my eye. So these notions are not coming up. Curiosity is suppressed. One is, so to say, with an explanation blind that this respect to other aspects of the phenomenology one would like to understand. I mention that because in many instances you will find theoretical points as being used as explanation. You, I recommend use an explanation as a stimulus to argue or to see why that and not something else. Uh, points of that sort, uh, or watch and see what did he explain, did he explain really the miraculous thing, that we have a closed visual field and no holes in it, or did he only escape that question by drawing the attention to another aspect of the phenomenon. I recall here for you, probably you all have read this morning, pleasure. Carlos Castaneda's various stories about uh, this attempt to learn how to see. And uh, the notion to learn how to see, of course. He uh, went to Mexico to introduce himself to a very famous brujo, a magician, and said, look, can you teach me to see? So Don Juan, who is the teacher, says, all right, uh, I will that come along with me, you go to the camarade, you go to the train, the train, the train. Yeah, so they walk in the morning for hours, camarade very hot, and uh, suddenly, don't go on, kicks Castanet. Look, 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 did you see that? See, I didn't see it. Okay, let's go. Oh, did you see that? So we went on and just again and again he's drawing attention to this and to that. Carlitos. Carlos, Castaneda. Didn't see anything. Finally, don't go at this. Well, I think. I understand why you don't see. You can only see things which you can explain. Things you can't explain. You don't see. So you have to learn to forget about the explanation and just see. Damn it. So I mean that's the point about the explanation which I would like to draw to you. In many cases, you may go, I'm trying to make a bridge again to the therapeutic situation, you may go into a therapeutic session, you say, ah, I understand, I can explain that. I have a theoretical approach where I can understand this and that. Of course, it is suppressed of a desire and blah 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 can come with a complicated theory whether the word instinct or the word drive and whether the word XYZ are being employed, then you have explained everything away, as some say. We explain things away instead of explaining them here. So that is the danger of explanation. Uh, the question is then, of course. From what did an explanation divert me so that I could not 
I can any longer. Uh, it's phenomenal. The essential schema of our explanatory devices, as I say, in Western culture, is uh, causation. You see, because of this, that and that is the case. Of course, if you use a metaphor, you don't say because of this. Uh, if you are a pattern, you are not saying this and that. You say only, is this so that? What would be a good citation on a panel? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not an explanation. It is a panel. And it is a way of how to behave. Now, of course, if you're a rich man, then you are building a very large needle with a big walk camel through and so we are a fossil thinker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> causality is uh, used in many cases for our experimental devices. And it is, funnily enough, although it is constantly being used, it is not completely understood. But a causality is a triadic situation. And why is it triadic? Because what you have is, you have first of all two things which are obvious. The one is the cause, and then it goes over into an effect. So you have cause and effect relationship. So one thinks there are only two. No. But there's a third, and that is the rule of transformation, which transforms what is once the cause into that which is afterwards the explanation. So here is our box, so to say, which transposes, transforms the cause into the appropriate effect. So you can see that very clearly. For instance, I feel this piece of chalk, I hold it with my finger. I open the fingers and the piece of chalk falls down. Cause, open the fingers. Effect, it is falling down. What is the apparatus which brings that piece of chalk down? Gravitation. The laws of nature, or the laws or the rules, are the ones who bring the effect about after a cause has been produced. Cause and effect are being connected through a rule, a law of transformation, transformation, transformation. You may also call it a computation. You wish compute a certain result with a certain star. Star this bottom. Uh, the first person in our Western history who addressed themselves in greatest detail to this phenomenology of the explanatory way of causation was Aristotle. And if you check, uh, uh, for instance, the Metaphysica, which is the eighth volume of uh, the usual presentation of Aristotle's writing, we find a major chapter dedicated to the notion of cause. cause and he distinguished at that time, uh, 300 BC, four types of causes. I will only mention four, so that you see we have them. And, uh, and yeah, I write them up here. Four cases. The one is on causa, causa materialis, then causa formalis. I will immediately explain what they are. Causa efficientis. And causa finalis. All be an English people material cause, uh, formal cause, efficient cause, and form cause. Now, the first two causes need essentially for, so for instance, causa formalis is the one you would use in mathematics. If you have developed a certain form of how modification to take place, today we would call it an algorithm, then an algorithm would present a causa formalis. Because from this thing, you go automatically to that thing because of formal reasons. Syntax is, for instance, a formal reason, which forces you to make a well-formed sentences by adhering to the rules of syntax. So when I say, for instance, I promise 
that, blah, 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 blah. And this, that, of course, is initiated by my promise. Oh, here comes from my materialis. Materialis is, for instance, some properties, chemical or physical properties. Matter, that matter melts, it's hotter, lead, or whatever. So the things are associated with matter. But causa efficientis and causa finalis, they are the standard uh, devices with which you operate, and the essential thing is causa efficientis. This is the one when we say, why? Why did this happen? And then you give a, 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 an efficient cause. Why did this piece of chalk fall out? Well, because I opened my fingers and the gravitation was pulling this thing down. That's a standard format of our explanatory strategies that we are falling back to causa efficiency. Lately, however, a different form of causa finalis has become very, very uh, important. And that is the cause which is sitting in the future. You see, the efficient cause, this one, is sitting in the past. It was that, and therefore that is it. But causa finalis is that is in the future is the cause, and I am acting accordingly today. For instance, if somebody would have asked me, I had to leave my place in Pescadero, and I drove over here, oh, let's say it was about the one. And if somebody said, why do you start your car and things like that? I say, I have a lecture to give at 2 o'clock in Stanford. So I have to do today, at that moment, I have to act in order that the future uh, event will take place. So when you use the term why, then it is causa efficient. And when you use, uh, well, because, why, and this is because. Causa finalis, however, is in order to, in order to. I do that in order that and that will happen, so that this shall happen in the future. And it has the great advantage, causa finalis, that you do not have to account for all the little details in between. Causa efficientis, you have to account for all the little details. So, uh, this thing, in order to, entails the notion of purpose. Why do you do that? My purpose is to do this and that and that and this. So the notion of purpose is entering here, and the whole field is being generated on the cause of being a nice thing, and this is, of course, cybernetics. Cybernetics is the theory of the yeah, theory of science of being with purposeful behavior. And the question, of course, then arises, what is the purpose of the notion of purpose? And the purpose of the notion of purpose, as you see again, is one of the second order notion, is that you avoid, by invoking the notion of purpose, you avoid giving detailed account of the processes that lead from one point to another. Nobody cares how I drive from Pescadero to Stanford. I could have driven over 92, 280, I could release this highway and that highway. Doesn't care. The only point is, do I arrive at 2 o'clock at Stanford? That is a question. I can ignore what is called science language, the trajectory. I don't have to pay attention to which way the goal is accomplished. The only thing we have to care for is that we accomplish the goal. Now, I would like to show you now why this particular mode, which is a triadic <coughs> of effect, the laws of transformation, came to Aristotle from that he was one of the first who addressed himself to logical conclusions, to logical rules. And uh, here is an exactly the same schema of the operation. It's the following thing. You start out is a major premise, for instance, the standard major premise in all the textbook of logic, you may remember them from high school, is all men are mortal. All men are mortal. All men are mortal. Major premise. Then comes, usually, in logic books, the minor premise. The minor premise is a special case. For instance, Socrates is a man. Man. Doctrine. 
conclusion, compute the answer of these two things, and I think you can figure out what you say. So it is what is the conclusion of these two things, major parameters. So you can take that. Law of nature is all men are mortal. Cause, the initial beginning, is Socrates is the main. But the result, the effect is that Socrates is mortal. Now I would like to draw your attention to this logical mechanism, which is directly applied to the cause and effect affair with the law of nature, uh, that even this logical fundamental notions, look at them with doubt. Watch what they are saying. They are all expressed in language, and language is not unambiguous. Even it says quite clearly something which you can arrest for the minute of time. For instance, all men are washed. All men are washed. Uh, I have uh, five billion counter examples for all men are not. And these five billion other examples are alive today. The globe of the population of the globe today was the last couple of weeks ago, the fifth billion human being was added to the population of the globe. They're all there and kicking. Right? You can only talk about all men are mortal when they're all dead, yeah? You need to care. And when their children are there, but nobody is around anymore, then we can really be safe to say all men are mortal. But then nobody can say all men are mortal. <laughs> I mean, I would like to draw your attention that even the fundamental logic notions there have already a bit in non-centicality, which I would like to invite you to check on everything that comes before you. Watch it. Ah, what is that? All men are mortal. Is that correct? Mm. Uh, okay. So this mechanism driving essentially our way of causality being derived from logical forms of conclusions and uh, the logical forms of conclusions are based of course on the linguistic ambiguity and therefore you may hang on with these ambiguities with most of the inferences you are thought you can make the unambiguous un unambiguous okay so this is just my short reference regarding uh, causality. There are several points, of course, to be made. There are several philosophers that are addressing themselves to the notion of causality. Kant, uh, for instance, uh, pointed out in his uh, fundamental work that everything has a cause. So Kant was essentially thinking in terms of causality. Aristotle, for instance, said, everything serves a cause. So he was thinking in terms of causa fidelis, because you are doing something in order to get the cause in the future. So Aristotle was a finalist, Kant was an efficientist, and then we have Wittgenstein. And uh, Wittgenstein, of course, was reflecting about the notion of causality, and he pointed out in his famous tract of the logical philosophical, I made it to you. Here we are. Uh, we cannot infer, this is, uh, this is proposition 5.1361. We cannot infer the events of the future from those of the present. The belief in the causal nexus is the superstition. So, I would like to present that to you so that you remember that I'm not a bad philosopher I'm trying to draw, draw your attention to the superstition which is called causality. Of course you know we are changing them all the time if they are not crazy in this way then they are doing that. Not another 10 minutes you have to embarrass and then we go to the next The next point which I promised I would talk about because for political reasons and the political reasons are the ones that I felt you should be informed of certain earlier notions which are rolling now from different other fields from philosophy and so forth. 
into the family therapeutic community. And they are essentially derived from the notion of ontology. And you will hear again and again ontological consideration, the ontology of this and the ontology of that. Now, what is ontology in the world, the term really based upon, and what is ontology indeed doing? And from an historical point of view, and also from a uh, functional point of view. Now, ontology derives itself from the Greek word a me. A me means to be. And on is the participle, means be. And if you translate being to the next Latin, then you say get esse. That means Ontology, somebody who is an ontologist, is essentially an essentialist. As opposed to existentialists, who are not sitting on ontology, because existere means to arise out of something, to become. An existentialist addresses himself to the notion of becoming. And the ontologist addresses himself to the notion of being. Of course, ontologists are politically very popular. And as you can clearly see, because we are referring in English to ourselves as human beings. Now, of course, if you are a human being, you have already all the green light to do anything you want, uh, because you are staying a human being. Of course, you can do all the ugly things that human beings do. Do but existentialists, of course, are interested in the emergence. And my proposal is, if you want to take yourself seriously, I would like to invite you, come along with me on a trip to become a human becoming. And if you switch from the human being to the human becoming, you will immediately realize that you have to watch your every step, or whether at the end of your step, you will still be a human becoming. And the moment you fall back to the being, no. being is dead, becoming is alive, I would say, right? politically oriented. <laughs> okay, ontology, as I say, come to me. Own is the word which says the being. And ontology arose in the late uh, 17th century, early 18th century. Essentially, because the question arose, can we prove the existence of God? And uh, that means the problem was to find out about the nature, how it is. How it is is the first one, the last question. And the it was, of course, God. How is he? fascinating aspect of the ontological proof of God, as you're perhaps familiar, earlier uh, high school or whatever, uh, that is that the, if the concept of something exists, from the existence of the concept to the existence of the thing can be inferred. So if we can think, if we have the concept of a perfect being, we can conclude the existence of the perfect being. So the thought implies the existence. This was the ontological proof. Now there are two major philosophers which undermine that proof. One, of course, you remember is Kant, the other one is Schopenhauer, and many other of the German philosophers, Hume, the English, of course, show the fallacious thing. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, type of ontological proof has switched now from God to the world. That means the it. We have to find out how it is, the it became the world. So that means ontology now is explaining the nature of the world. In doing that, the only when you postulate that, you are planting to yourself, and maybe to your listener, a trap. And that trap is that you stipulate, of course, a world. And that must be a world, otherwise you can't explain it. So explaining the world, explaining the nature of the world, you have already populated the world, sneaks in under, under, underneath, you see, and nobody really draws your attention there it is. You are just talking about as if it were there. But the as if is not even mentioned. It. So the ontology is stipulating 
an around and therefore has a great danger to slide, to slip, to fall into the notion of a naive realism. Like realism says, yeah, independent of me, there's a universe, and for me, the job is only with my tape recorders and with my uh, video recorders, which are built in here and there and there and there, whatever, to find out what that world is. It's not a logical thing. The point which is the dangerous point, and unfortunately, I do not have Martin Buber here. I want to read the Buber to you. It's translated beautifully into English, and uh, you read it. I thought I had to have to sleep here. If I, if I search a little bit, I can find it. If I find it, I will read it to you. I was convinced I had that over here. Just relax for a second. I read it to you, and then we have the intermission. If I find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you invent them? You, you can invent them, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh, because it's not so easy to reinvent Uber. He's so good. That's what had to be Uber to invent it. Yeah, I think I don't have it here. Now, anyway, what Uber is referring to uh, is essentially that he's warning from the essential points of Heidegger, and the Heidegger points are that he's speaking about a Dasein, of an essence, of a being, always the notion of the being, and the danger which arises out of this notion of the being, as opposed to the notion of becoming, I was trying uh, to present here, that uh, the being is incapable of interacting with another being. Therefore, dialogue in the Heideggerian universe it's an absurdity, but in the Buberian universe, dialogue is the essence. On dialogue, we become. On monologue, we be, we are. So the switch from monologue to dialogue is to leave the ontological perception, to switch to ontogenetic perception. Why do I stress that? Because you as friendly therapists base your effective therapy on dialogue. It is the dialogue which is doing the thing. I would like to last before we go and have a break to give you my observation, which was for me absolutely striking. I was once sitting behind these, uh, uh, the half mirror uh, glass looked at the family and all my colleagues who were discussing the case left the room so I was alone and while I was alone and watching here the therapist interacting with the family in the main room I thought uh, I would like to switch off the, the sound which was of course tied through because I wanted to see whether they give each other gesticular clues other kinds of clues of movement so I turned off the sound so for the next 30 minutes what did I see? I saw on the phone. And after about 30 minutes. Yeah. I turned off the sound, walked out and asked the therapist. How was it? Was it a good session? It was a very good session. Aha, this was a very good session. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nobody ate a pill. Nobody got knocked over the head. Nobody was receiving anything. They were just making movements with their lips with a little bit of noise coming out. That means this noise was transforming a group of people who came in with a problem and felt relieved after they were exposed to human noise for about an hour. 
If that is not a magic, I don't know what. This is the thing I would like to make a petition. And uh, they call you whenever we have a little and may I, may I just say two or three things regarding this? Say only one thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, I mean, uh, what you said is so important in terms of our belief that once we have a name for a condition, then the condition as such must exist. <laughs> Since there is a name, schizophrenia, and this is of course particularly convincing with Greek names, the thing, <laughs> therefore, has to exist, and one begins to research it and measure it and all of this. The second thing is that I have mentioned in the, in the first symposium the work of Hans Feidinger, ah, the author of yeah. the philosopher of is the Is it exists in English? It in English? In English? Yes, yes. This is must yes. read in yes. It's only 800 pages. <laughs> 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 it's a fantastic collection of examples that show you how we always act on a stiff assumptions. And when you begin to think in those terms, you begin to see that therapy is a change from one ACF assumption to another that is less painful. And the last thing, uh, Carlos, uh, once, Carlos Luzki, once had a session with a Mexican couple. And Don Jackson in the same position as you, in your observation room, all his, all his, the only Spanish he speaks yeah, yeah, yeah. is uh, Buenos Dias. Yeah. And so um, he watched the entire session and then was able no, he knew exactly what he <coughs> So, as you say, yeah, there yeah. is so much yeah. injustice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, and excuse the interruption. Continue on the marathon. Uh, it is, of course, and data on a major uh, source. <coughs> and I have right now to deliver. Of the balance. I think three more points, each one ten minutes, so it's half an hour. Uh, and uh, then uh, the last point of today, which is computation. So take a deep breath, I think you had enough coffee now to sustain for like 15, 12, 16, 75 minutes. Okay, the next I would like to touch. I know I've already touched a little bit before, but we'll call it the key. And this is the inclusion. Uh, the, if you have the inclusion of anything into something. Uh, we have, in our Western tradition, avoided as much as we can the inclusive notion. We always try to treat the world as being here and I am there. Usually when we are making a reference to the world, and then it's always the other thing, and not we. Uh, you can, uh, it's a very fascinating notion which is in English is really of making two words out of one word of the whole epistemology changes fundamentally. Am I a part of the world or am I a part of the world? So you connect a part and get a part and then you're separate. And then you're a part, you're in it. So, two fundamental different positions. The world is out there, or I am part of the world. That means the moment I'm part of the world, then I change, the world changes. Everything changes with me. And uh, why do I address myself to that point? Is there a business in my hospital? I feel Correct me or me, drop it. So that if you, when you are joining this group of people or family, and you are there, a part of that group, the question is, what did I ask for? Are you part of this thing, or are they out there and you are only giving advice? Or are you co-change, change within the whole system? And I propose this, and I mean, show you, I think, tomorrow in greater detail, that if you adopt the position that you are part, then you connected to that system is one of the elements, and co-change with the system, then, and indeed you do, you can't help it. Every question, every interaction, every question, from the mama to the papa to the kid, immediately changes you because you know this is the system. 
a response for this, for that, which is not known. So, what are the difficulties of a logic which includes the observer in the system? The observer is part of the system. And our Western tradition has tried everything in order to exclude the observer from the system. In fact, one of the most popular versions of exclusion is the notion of objectivity. You know, the basic function of objectivity is that the description of an observation should not contain the properties of the observer in the description. It means no properties of the observer should enter the description. The description should be, so to say, as if the observer would be free looking in the, to the nirvana, to the yonder. But of course the whole thing is so crazy because without the observer, with his property of being able to observe, there wouldn't be any observation from the start. So you need the property of being able to observe in order to be an observer. So to separate the observation from the observer is in itself already absolutely crazy. But that is of course bringing about the tremendous con uh, 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 notion of EMI. There are you. The moment when you integrate yourself, there is a different organization structure. And the names for these two structures, and the one case when you are outside of the whole thing, the main structure is that of a hierarchy. A hierarchy and you remember it like that. Somebody is sitting on top and telling the others what to do, right? And they have to do. And what is usually on top is the holy, the hieros, and arcane in Greek means rule. So in a hierarchy, the holy rule sends down the command, tells you what to do. The idea of, of course, the government tells you what to do, this says you what to do, everybody says what to do, and of course the basic structure of the hierarchy structure of the structure of objectivity out there as the word idea is of course a moral code, a codex which starts out with thou shall. You have to do this, you have to do it. Nobody says what I have to do. Always what they have to do. Anyway, always there. Now I see. A replacement with the inclusion is a different organization structure, which is called heterarchy. Heterarchy. Arcane means there was rule. That is the word running from. Here is the holy, and here it is the other, heteros. Heteros means the other. And the organization of the hierarchy is this. <laughs> and at any particular moment, this guy may rule, that means he may tell the others what to do, or in another moment, this guy may, may rule, it's always the other, the heteros, who is ruling at the moment. There are some very lovely principles which we have to go into this detail. Uh, but the, it, this is, of course, the inclusion notion. The, you can flip, I would propose to you, you can do this experimentation in your session as a faculty therapist. You can play golf. Or you can play participant. So there are the choices, of course, which you can do. And uh, my recommendation is, watch it. If you switch to play golf, you should know that you are playing golf. If you are switching around and you play a participant, you should know that you are playing a participant. So these are two modes of interacting with a group of people. Hierarchically or hierarchically. I would like to address myself, of course, to the hierarchical notion which is a relatively new one. The first time the word hierarchy was popped up was produced by a very great neurophysiologist, I should be a neurophilosopher, Warren McCulloch, who died about 10 years ago, years ago. Uh, I think I referred to him in the literature, I think he was in the literature of yeah. Warren McCulloch, who wrote a wonderful paper, 1943, A Hierarchy of Values, 
a hierarchy of value determined by the topology of the nervous system. You pointed out that uh, you, you follow what a hierarchy of values is. A hierarchy of values is that you may have what is called a Gregory Bates, and what you may find also in the therapeutic system. That's where Gregory Bates refer to as value anomaly. You give somebody a choice between two things, A and B, yeah. apples and, and bananas, and you prefer bananas, you say bananas and bananas. <laughs> you give somebody a choice between bananas and cherries, B and C, and he say, I like cherries. And then you give him, of course, a choice between A and C. And if the logic would be the classic orthodox logic, he would, of course, say, I have, of course, C. C is better than B. B is better than A. A is, C is better than A. But he may decide A is better than A. So he may prefer a choice, which is called the normal choice. This is a better. So you are not climbing up and climbing up and climbing up in your hierarchical structure of values, but you have a values which go in circles. So it was this problem to which these people addressed themselves. You can find out that, for instance, in a choice structure within a family, you may have a typical value anomaly popping up. And orthodox logic, this was referred to as ill, sick. If you are dealing with human beings, you see, the logic is sick because it doesn't handle a real situation. You flip the whole thing around. Again, this my proposal. Turn things upside down. Somebody says that the people are crazy. No, the logic is crazy with which we try to handle that particular case. So watch the logic is break. You get attention to that. Okay. Now, why has this never been considered? Why have these circular value systems? Why has the inclusion notions never been considered? The reason why these uh, things have never been considered is because the self-referential situation, if you are within such a circle, you will refer ultimately to yourself. But you can, okay, you get around this circle, you can make the circle a little bit shorter. You can make it this way, for instance, like in a couple. Yeah? But you can do it that way, that means you make the shortest Literally, circle is a reference to yourself. This is self-referential situation. But in all our traditional logic, the self-referential uh, situation were avoided. Now, why? And they were avoided now for over 2,500 years. Since Epimenides, a Greek philosopher, came up with the following statement, which I give you and ask you, what would you do with that statement, if I come to you and say, I am, I am a liar. Now you have the choice. Is he speaking the truth? Is he a liar? No. The choice. He has lied. Because he's speaking the truth. But uh, if he has lied, then he might be a liar. Ah, but then he's told the truth. Uh, but maybe it's not the truth that you can lie. So, <coughs> these peculiar state of affairs are referred to as paradoxes. And the paradoxes are, of course, a pain in the neck for all logicians. <laughs> because why are they a pain? Instead of having fun with them, they are pain in the neck. But the pain in the neck is only because of Miss Aristotle, who pointed out that a statement, a proposition, <coughs> which, in order to have sense, or it could be accepted as a proposition, must be either true or else false. Anything which is not doing that will be rejected as a proposition. So whenever problems of that sort pop up, and they always pop up in the referential situation, then according to Aristotle, they have to be thrown out of the window. Therefore, self-reference was avoided on and on and on over the centuries because of this cause. That's the point why nobody addressed himself to self-referential situation. It's only in the computer age that people have been to begin that the referential, self-referential statements are very important because all our computer clocks, all our quartz clocks have a built-in 
paradox. Because if they say on, the circuit says off. And when it says off, the circuit says on. You can say for on and off, you say true or false. So when it says true, the next state is false. When it says false, the next state is true. True, false, TF, TF, TF. Flips around. If you're a good crystal, it will do it with such a precision that for weeks and months you can use it as a watch and uh, uh, time your, your time on that paradox which is building into your, into your watch. So, paradoxical situations generate time into the logic. Usually time was out of logic, logic was a timeless system. Everything was out of case. But the paradox generates on or true form. This is the, 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 uh, the liar. You assume he is lying, the next moment he is being the truth. If you think he is doing this truth, then he is lying. When he is lying, he is being the truth. Flip, flop, flip, flop. And in fact, in engineering technology, they are called flip flops. These circuits are called flip flops. They are the basic clocks for all the big machines, and whether it's small computers, the big computers, the big mainframes, that of course everything is clocks. Okay. But there's another consequence in the moment when you accept self referentiality as a basis, and you eliminate the problematic, which is usually referred to as an essential point. And that is that suddenly you are referring anything to you. It is not that you are being ordered by somebody else. You are determining yourself. That means self-determination is coming about. Self-reference, self-determination, or the notion of, uh, of consciousness. Consciousness of consciousness is self-consciousness. That means you are beginning to notice what happens if I do my reflection of myself. With this, of course, automatically in the, allow, in the moment you allow self-determination, you are generating the notion of freedom, you are generating the notion of uh, responsibility. In the moment you have responsibility, you have a basis for ethics. And therefore, I would like to point out, see how far-reaching these notions are when you flip from this thing where anybody else is telling you what to do in this situation. You have to tell yourself what to do, and therefore you are responsible for your action. Therefore, uh, uh, responsibility and ethics is entering this kind of epistemology. Now, the point is there which I would like to end here is that there is absolutely no need for being afraid of self referential situations because self referential situations can produce very stable, even in time, stable situations. For instance, take the following statement, which is a self-referential statement. And this is as follows. This sentence, this sentence, yes, and then you make a couple of dots. Dot, letter. Now the problem which uh, I invite you to, to play when you go home and think a little bit about it is to put in here the numeral in spelled out which would make that sentence true. So if you were to say has two letters, you easily see that would do. Because clearly this sentence has already many more letters than two. And clearly, if you have a solution for that thing, then it is a self-referential situation and uh, it's not doing any flip-flops. So it is a stable self-referential situation and therefore all the, the, uh, the fear that self-reference would produce paradoxical situations is absolutely fine. In order that you see that I'm not uh, pulling your leg, I will give you one solution for that problem. I tell you there are two solutions for this problem and I would like to invite you to think about the second solution. I give you one. And the one solution is 31. Okay. One. Now 
Now let's see other oh, letters. This sentence says 31 letters. Let's see how that is correct. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. So, note, this sentence has 31 letters, has 31 letters. You see what's coming up in all these self-referential things when there are stable solutions? Solutions of such problems are usually called eigen-solutions, eigen-values of that system. Eigen. i tell you what eigen means in German, is a German word, eigen-value. The word eigen means self. And it came about that these notions a self value, that means a self fulfilling value. This sentence has 31 is the value which fulfills this sentence. So it's called an eigen, a self value. The history of the term eigen is because around the end of the 19th century, one of the great German mathematicians, David Hilbert, ran into problems of a mathematical structure of the same kind. That means, so to say, that the solution was part of the problem. Uh, in which way to solve that? He called the solution of such problems eigen solution, and the whole type of problems eigen problems. Eigen problem is a problem which only is being satisfied with a solution which is part of the same. So therefore, the term eigen value. And my invitation to you is: think about the second eigen value which exists here, and if you think about it, it will be a fabulous exercise for you. You see what are the features of such eigenvalues. What are the features of a situation where a self-reference has to come about? We do not know yet how to come about. We will find that some cases, for instance, in a family situation. Family situation gropes about an identification problem. They don't know who are they, what's going on. Uh, they have different days and different that. Treat a family problem as an eigenproblem. What are the realities? They have to invent in order to find a solution for their own coexistence. So it becomes an eigen problem. So this is what I want to do. Now, you're ready to jump, that's fine. I would like now to switch to the problem of language, because I said language is the essential magic which is driving the whole psychotherapeutic process. It's mainly different psychotherapy is always by a discussions, by a dialogue that you are straightening out. The more I could even propose, you can have a measure of the intensity of a dialogic situation, the more dialogue is taking place and not monologue. You know of some th th therapies, they are essentially monologically. Only one is talking. In those cases, mostly the patient, so-called patient, who is being invited to talk, talk, talk. Uh, that's not that's not interaction. The only thing in the dialogue is if the other one would listen, but of course the other one does not need to listen. He can think about the movies he's going to make, what kind of a uh, supper he will share with whom, etc. Anyway, that is a non a monologic situation. I invite you to contemplate a family therapeutic situation, dialogic situation, not language. Now, if you want to know about something about language, of course, we may ask a famous question. <coughs> what is language? Now, in a moment, somebody is coming to you or comes to me and says, what is language? I say, well, I'm sorry. You must know already what language is, otherwise you couldn't have asked me the question because you put the question in language. So apparently one knows already what language is in order to be able to ask the question. Now Wittgenstein even made it once more wittier in, the, in, in one of his uh, discussions about language. He said, what is a question? Ask, what is language? So the fascinating thing is that language 
there's already a self-reparation situation. Why? Because language has the word language in its vocabulary. Language has the word word in its vocabulary. Language can talk about language, <coughs> otherwise we wouldn't have linguists. The fascinating thing, however, with linguists, they are not interested in language. Uh, the standard notion of a linguist is that he is interested in what he calls linguistic competence. But the funny thing in language is not that you are able to speak a, a so-called well-formed sentences. The problem of language is that somebody says something and another understands. It is not the question of monologue, the question of language is dialogical. Fascinating thing in the study of linguistics is that you find linguists address themselves not to communicative competence, they address themselves to linguistic competence. And linguistic competence is the competence to utter well formed sentences. That means sentences in which the grammar is correct, the syntax. But what it says is completely irrelevant. I would say that is not study of language, it is study of some kind of a of a mechanical process of generating what is called waveform formulae in automata theory or waveform languages in that aberration of the linguistic. Uh, that you see that language is in a sense a self-referential situation. I have an example. I think those who have that sheet which is practically empty and then on the middle corner, the funny in entrance is like okay, after, later, and subsequently, and so forth. I don't know whether you have this sheet. Probably one of you may And if you don't have that particular sheet, which we call that particular deliver, then you have my German thing that is the same story. It is a story of me coming to the United States and trying to learn English, but I try to learn English uh, not with a German English teacher, like it, but with a Webster, a Webster, a little large Webster, and uh, I said, I look up this word and I will find an explanation. And I will be glad that it is. So I was looking up, I did that over after the 